because what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk about one of my favorite philosophers, thinkers that ever lived, St. Augustine. And a lot of people don't know about St. Augustine or very little, if they do know very little about him, but St. Augustine was born in Africa. He lived in Northern Africa. And he was born in, let me see, 354 AD. And he was, his father was a pagan and his mother was Christian, so he came from a mixed marriage. And St. Augustine, um, his parents thought he was very bright and although they were poor, they pulled together the resources to give their son a great education. So the first part of his education was in rhetoric. In other words, you know, try, learning sophistry, learning how to be a lawyer, learning tricks. And this is what he, he learned how to do. Um, when he was about 17 or 18, he joined this cult called the Manichaeans, which was headed up by this guy called Manny. And basically, the Manichaean cult said that the world is made up of two substances. One, you have darkness and evil. And on the other hand, you have light and the good. And so this was what St. Augustine, he, he left uh, being a catechumen of Catholicism and he joined Manny's uh, little cult. And so the whole um, idea of um, good and evil, which is a very, which is something that everybody fights with, I think. What is good, what is evil? Everybody fights with that idea. And so he found some refuge in that until they couldn't answer many questions that he, you know, put out to them. So what Augustine did is he left the Manichaeans and he joins um, another group of people. Um, and basically their worldview is that um, God is bad. And the reason God is bad is because there's evil in the world. And if you have an all-knowing and an all-loving God, how can an all-knowing, all-loving God allow evil to exist? So this is a question that, you know, you've got to ask yourself today. I mean, when you see the enormous amount of evil that's going on, but also an enormous amount of good, too. So we're at a cusp, we're at a real crisis right now, whereby we're either going to win, okay, and join BRICS, and develop the world and have a real renaissance, okay, which we could do. And it really is up to the United States. Or we're going down to the road of perdition, okay? And um, that leads me to uh, something that I wanted to show you. I wanted to show you um, a clip from a film which deals with this idea of religion and what a lot of people in America think religion is or think what God is all about. And um, people call the United States a Judeo-Christian nation, but actually it isn't. It's pretty pagan. I mean, what's honored more than the good is you know, lust, well, money, making more, more okay, yeah, money. exactly, war, this sort of thing. Well, there was a movie that was made back in the, um, I believe in the late 50s, and it's a, uh, from the book Sinclair Lewis's book, Elmer Gantry. And um, I don't know if anyone has seen the film. I highly recommend that you view the whole film because you'll really get a sense of what this evil is. But I want, um, I want you to see this 
um, clip from the movie, Burt Lancaster stars in it, and he plays um, a um, he he plays a um, like he's a minister. He's not. He's a very uh, he's very lustful, and he has a lot of problems, and. Nonetheless, what he does is he is, is, has joined this fundamentalist cult that go around and, and uh, they, they uh, have their fundamentalist revival in these tents. And this actually was going on in the United States at the time, in the 20s, and in earlier the United States. Um, the early uh, Americans also got caught up in this. And a guy named Jonathan Edwards, who was uh, a rev so-called reverend, you know, would set up these tents and uh, have these revival meetings. And what they would say was um, there were more souls being begetted in the back of the tents than there were souls that were saved through the meetings. So, uh, at any rate, I want to show you this clip. Is that movie? That, uh, the one with, yeah, we're not going to watch that part right now. No, we're, gonna, we're just, just going to watch a certain part of this. It's a good one. Good. Here we go. You're all sinners. You're all doomed to perdition. You're all going to the painful, stinking, scalding, everlasting tortures of a fiery hell. Created by God for sinners, unless, unless, unless you repent. Repent with Sister Falconer! <coughs> saw on this little clip, you know, where he's praising this man who comes out as a total beast, barking like a dog, okay? Well, that and seemed like a setup. It, God was, no, it wasn't a setup. He wasn't a No, guy. it was not a setup. What, it was, what, what Burt Lancaster was doing is he was driving people to the edge, okay, by telling them they were going to die and suffer in hell. This is not a setup. That guy was not paid to do that. He was driven crazy, deliberately, okay, by the reverend, okay? And this is what most religion is about in the United States anyway. I mean, that's extreme. <laughs> I'll grant you that. But um, it's... Uh, So the, I guess the first question, let me, get, let me get my notes right here. Okay. All right, so, you know, the question is, I think, um, how are we going to organize the population? What, what things do we have to work through inside ourselves to make us better people? That, that we'll be able to take our neighbors and our friends and shake some sense into them. And this is, this is why I wanted to give this class, because St. Augustine uh, 
I mean, he, he was recruited by St. Ambrose in Milan to Christianity and studied under St. Ambrose. One of the reasons he didn't like Christianity at first, which is why a lot of good people um, don't like to go to church or, you know, say their prayers, is because of dogmatism. Since that, you know, the idea is, is that if you don't go to church every Sunday, God is going to send you to hell. That these are mortal sins and venial oh, sins yes. and so forth. And what so St. Augustine was trying to get through was what's fundamental? Who is God? And if God exists, what is evil? And what is good? So that's why we're um, discovering we're pushing this. Now this is sort of like my um, fourth venture into this question of religion. Uh, back in March, I believe, I started part one on Moses, and then the following month, I did one on Christ. The following month, I did one on um, the early Christian fathers, which led up to this one here on St. Augustine, who is perhaps the greatest of the church fathers. Um, and it's a Prometheus Zeus question, with Augustine being in the uh, role of Prometheus, the man or the god, actually the man that um, gave fire to men, thereby lifting them up and you know, allowing them to become more than just, you know, yes, more than animals, but to actually use fire as a technology. Um, but I wanted to um, ask, before I ask the question of evil, which I'm going to do, I wanted to really ask how many people here have tried to organize somebody to come to a meeting or to call their congressman. How many people here have tried to do that? <laughs> okay. Now, what does typically people say to you? What do people typically say? It won't do, it do any good. It won't do any good. That's what they say to me. Which really makes me angry. <laughs> 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 Anything else? What else? It won't do any good. Is there anything else? It'll never work. <laughs> It'll never work. It's never work. So okay. They say, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. Okay. They know what to say about a lot of other things. <laughs> they don't know what to say to their congressmen. <laughs> so, um, anyways, what we have to do is, I think this will help in terms of getting you to help these people over this wall that they're facing. They're facing a brick wall. And I think this, um, this brick wall and the fact that they won't act is, is evil. And the question I want to pose to you is, um, why do you think God, who is all good and all knowing, allowed evil to exist in the world. If he's all good and all knowing, why do you have evil? Well, I, I think he allowed evil to exist in the world to sort of punish people because he well, then knows how is that, he... that many people don't believe in him. They, they don't want to obey him. They don't want uh -huh. to follow his so it's for punishment. You're saying God wants evil in the world to punish them. Now, does that sound like um, a, a very nice God? <laughs> no. That he put evil here to punish people? I would just you know, think about it. It's that man is the embodiment of God. Mm -hmm. And therefore, man has the potential to do the good, to act in the name of God, in the image of God. And therefore, if we choose, Mm -hmm. not to act in the image of good, and not to enforce the good, not to do the good, then it's not a God that is malevolent or a God that hates us, wants to punish us. It's us, it's we who need to learn not to punish ourselves mm -hmm. by using the 
and developing the powers that we have been given because mm -hmm. we've been given great power as human beings. That's freedom right. Of choice. Um, excuse me? What freedom of choice? Freedom of choice. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's what you were getting at. And Eileen, you knocked it right. You hit it the nail on the head. It is it's a question of free choice of the will. So <clears throat> What I'd like to do at this point is to, um, I'm going to put this on the board and I'm going to ask Diane to, she and I are going to do a little dialogue from St. Augustine from book one, chapter one, the very beginning of his book. And it's um, entitled, uh, book one, chapter one, Is God the Cause of Evil? And I'm going to have it here on the board. Um, so you can follow it easier while we're reading it, yes? Well, there was an angel in heaven, supposedly, and his name was Satan. And he was trying to prove that God um, was a liar, that, uh, that evil, that Adam and Eve would not die if they took the, took the, the fruit from mm -hmm. the tree of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And he, he got a lot of other angels to back him up. And they all decided they, to they, become they, evil. They all decided to become evil and follow Satan. And God threw Satan out of heaven mm -hmm. and threw him to earth. So that we have Satan on earth who is the epitome of evil. Mm -hmm. And uh, God gave us freedom. Of, well, he gave us commandments and regulations, like the 12 commandments plus other commandments that we're supposed to follow. But Satan. Um, I get where you're going. Mm -hmm. Let me propose this instead, though, okay? Because. Um, if you read um, John Milton, Paradise Lost, what you find out is, is that the reason for uh, Lucifer, which means light, okay, the reason Lucifer um, rebels against God is because God made man. And God made man in his image. And God loved man more than he loved the angels. And so this made Lucifer mad. And so jealousy is the there's yeah, it's lust. It's the reason part of that. Yes. All right, let's read can you excuse me, what was his original name? What country was he from? Augustine. Yes. From he was from a, a place called Tagasta. T A G A S T E. What? No. Mm -hmm. No, it's Tun Tunisia, North Africa. He went. To, he he was uh, educated in Carthage. <coughs> He's African. Um. So, all right. Can you see that? Okay. African. You mean born in Africa? Yeah. He's an African. I don't know what he looked like, but I think he would. I mean, North Africa. He was definitely didn't have blonde hair and blue eyes like they portrayed <laughs> Jesus in the movies. <laughs> Okay, and what about what year was he born? 354. AD. AD. Hmm? I have some, I have two pictures. Which oh. One. Of what? Oh, sure, go ahead. They're not exactly photographs. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> sure. What do we have? Yeah, that's There's, it. that's it. like a, probably a few hundred years after he was alive, I'm guessing. So, looks North African, right? He's <laughs> not Swedish. <laughs> the other one is this, is, this is the Renaissance version of it. Oh, they lightened him up. Oh, now he looks at them. Yeah, but they also gave him, he, they do give him majesty. I mean, you do have a sense of the, I mean, of him. Yeah, right. <laughs> so right. 
Well, this has the uh, various <laughs> geometric articles that he's involved with right, as well. Okay. I didn't even know that. Over in this part of the painting is a big globe. It's looking at that globe. Oh, that's right. You're right. Mm -hmm. It's a painting by Botticelli. Okay. So I want to make sure you can read along with Diane and I on, the, on uh, book one. Is God the Cause of Evil? Um, I'm going to give Diane the part of Evodius, and I'll be Augustine. And this is a, it's like a, it is a platonic dialogue. This is like what Socrates would do, and how he would, you know, they would have a back and forth and how he educated people. So, um, I, can you, is, do we need to put out the lights, or is that okay? Okay, great, great. Um, it's going to be hard for me to read my book. Okay. Shall I start? Tell me, please, whether God is not the cause of evil. I shall, if you will explain what kind of evil you mean. For we usually speak of evil in two senses. <clears throat> One, when we mean that someone has done evil. The other, when we mean that someone has suffered evil. I want to know about both kinds. But if you know or believe that God is good, and it is not right to believe otherwise, God does, do, God does not do evil. Also, if we admit that God is just, and it is a sacrilege to deny this, he assigns rewards to the righteous and punishments to the wicked, punishments that are indeed evil for those who suffer them. Therefore, if no one suffers punishments unjustly, this too we must believe, since we believe that the universe is governed by divine providence. God is the cause of the second kind of evil, but not the first. Then, is there some other cause of the latter kind of evil, which, as we found, God did not cause? Certainly. For evil could not have come into being without a cause. However, if you ask what the cause may be, I cannot say, since there is no one cause. Rather, each evil man is the cause of his own evil doing. If you doubt this, then listen to what we said above. Evil deeds are punished by the justice of God. It would not be just to punish evil deeds if they were not done willfully. I do not know whether anyone sins who has not learned how to sin. But if this is the case, from whom I ask have we learned how to sin? Do you think that education is something good? Who would dare to say that education is evil? Suppose it is neither good nor evil. I think it is good. Oh, very well. Provided that knowledge is given or awakened by education, and no one can learn anything except through education, or do you disagree? I think that only good things can be learned through education. Therefore, you must see that evil is not learned. Indeed, the very word education is derived from the verb to learn. How is it then that man does evil if evil is not learned? Perhaps because he avoids and turns from education, by which I mean the act of learning. But whether this or something else is true, the following is clear. Since education is good and education is derived from learning, evil cannot be learned. For if evil is learned, then evil is a part of education, and education will not be something good. However, as you yourself grant, it is good. Therefore, evil is not learned, and it is useless to ask from who we learn evil. Or if we learn evil, we learn so as to avoid it, not to do it. From this reasoning, we may say that to do evil is to turn from education. To proceed then, 
I think that there are two kinds of education. One by which we learn to do good, and another by which we learn to do evil. When you asked whether education was good, my attention was caught by the love of the good, and I thought only of the education which has to do with good deeds. This is why I answered that education was good. Now, however, I realize there is another kind of education which I assert without doubt is evil. And I now ask for the cause of this. At least you think that understanding is good. Yes. I think it so good that I do not see anything in man that could be more excellent. And I assert that there is no kind of understanding which can be evil. OK, what then of this? If someone is taught and yet does not understand, do you think he can be called a learned man? Absolutely not. If therefore every kind of understanding is good and no one learns who does not understand, then everyone who learns is doing good. For everyone who learns understands and everyone who understands is doing good. Therefore, whoever seeks the cause of our learning, something is surely asking for the cause of our, of our doing good. So stop trying to find some unknown evil teacher. If he is evil, he is not a teacher. If he is a teacher, he is not evil. We have some teachers in the room. <laughs> 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 and they fight this every single day because of the evil culture that we live in. So this is, yeah. So, um, so basically, um, what Augustine does is he lays out, you know, the, the very firm idea that God does not create evil. Okay, and that evil comes from another source. And we discussed earlier that that source is from the freedom of the will. That is, God granted us complete freedom to choose the good or the bad. And what um, I'd like to go to is the topic of um, what is the source of the evil? Why is it that man commits evil. What what is what, why does man do this? Why does he commit evil? Any ideas? Uh, it it could be jealousy of other men It could I be jealousy, yeah. Other men have more or not or I don't have their talents. Right. Right. That could be one factor. That's one factor. Anybody got a Self second one? Selfishness? Selfishness and you can go for a third. Three. His view of man. Three. His view of man. Okay. Greed. Greed. Just to, I was I think it's sort of a lack of understanding that not insisting on the good amounts to evil because we look at classical literature and one of the most prevalent things we see is I didn't do anything. Right. <laughs> oh. Crisis. Yeah. Right. Well you, you know, all these things that were brought up are all true. But the answer that I'm really looking for sort of like covers every single one of what you brought out. And that is the question of lust. What Augustine argues is the fact that lust is the source of evil. And um, what, does he mean by lust? What, did he, what does he mean by lust? OK. He means greed. What is greed? You're lusting after something, okay? All of these things that people mentioned, you know, so you covet money, you are jealous of somebody who has more than you do. In other words, man is more tied, his soul, he lets his soul become more tied to the idea of uh, temporal things, that is, you know, things from sense certainty Man is more tied to sense certainty than he is tied to reason. So you're saying that in the case of indifference, man is lusting after things that are not specifically good. 
is that I'm, I mean, I'm wondering if that's what you're implying in that case. Um, I don't think I understand your question fully. Well, earlier, you know, just a few seconds ago, I brought up the idea that a lot of people are indifferent, in a sense, to oh. the idea that they must do the good. Right. They say, I didn't do anything, right. so I'm not to blame That's the sin of omission. Yeah. Yes. That is, that is a very great sin. It's the biggest excuse, you know, that'll, uh, that'll get you. They haven't it's, been educated either. That's true. But so what, whose job is it to educate these people besides people who have degrees in teaching? Whose job is it to educate? Well, the, the, the priest did it originally. It's like when people see me reading, they say, are you taking a class? It's like, no. I want to improve myself, so I read. I don't need to have, some people can't know, I say, if you don't have to read, why do it? You know, <laughs> it's not required. You finish the school, there's no point in reading. You're supposed to learn everything while you're in school. After that, you don't need to learn anymore. Right. It's amazing to me that people really want, that they, I don't know, that the schools have made them so hate learning so much that they just feel so as though they're, they're, they feel like it's torture. Mm -hmm. So I want to get out of school, they don't want to do it anymore so it, because they were so bored in school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's, that's part of it, but this has been going on for a long time. I mean, if you think of um, many American citizens who you would consider to be basically good people. You know, they don't run around and murder and rape and, you know, they, they, you know, if you ask them for a cup of sugar, they'll give it to you. And, you know, basically a lot of people who are they have a good heart, mm -hmm. but is a good heart good enough? Is a good heart good enough when you're trying to fight Obama <laughs> and the evil in the world? Mm -hmm. Is it good enough just to have a good heart? And, you know, Augustine would argue that that isn't good enough. It isn't. It's not good enough. He, he would argue, again, this question of lust, and not just lust, of money, but also sexual lust. The thing about Augustine, which is very interesting, is, is that when he was 18 years old, he filed, he um, filed, he uh, uh, had a child born out of wedlock. And um, for many years, between the time he was 18 and 33, <coughs> you know, he had many mistresses. He committed many sins. And he understood this idea of lust very, very well. And that, that this was one of the things that brought man down. And why does it bring man down? It brings man down because it's all sense certainty. It's, it's all it ha has to do with your senses and not with reason. So the idea of, of lust is, um, something that uh, all of us have to fight against all the time. And as I said, not just the sexual lust, but the greed, the jealousy, you know, all the other things that go with it. I think, um, I think it'd be good if we read the chapter on lust is the source of evil, chapter three. Put some spice to it. All right. <laughs> Some more spice. All right. Lust is the source of evil. <clears throat> you are really asking why we do evil? But first we must discuss what evil doing is. Explain what your opinion is in this matter. If you cannot answer the whole of the question in a few brief words, at least make your views known to me by mentioning particular evil deeds. Adultery, homicide, sacrilege, not to mention others which time and memory do not permit me to recount. Who does not consider these evil? Then first tell me, why do you think adultery is an evil? Because the law forbids it? Certainly it is not an evil because the law forbids it. Rather, adultery is forbidden because it is evil. 
What if someone should harass us by exalting the delights of adultery, asking us why we condemn adultery as evil and worthy of punishment? You do not suppose, do you, that men who are eager not only to believe but even to understand ought to take refuge, refuge in the authority of law as a reason? Indeed, I believe as you believe, and am firm in my belief, I cry out that all people and all nations ought to believe adultery is evil. But now we are struggling to know with our understanding and to establish most firmly what we have already accepted by faith. Therefore, consider as best you can and tell me the reason why you know adultery to be wrong. I know that adultery is an evil because I myself would be unwilling to allow adultery in the case of my wife. And whoever does to another what he does not wish done to himself does evil. Okay, what if someone's lust is so great that he offers his own wife to another and willingly allows her to be seduced by the man with whose wife he in turn wants to have equal license. Do you think that he does evil? Yes, the worst evil. <laughs> By the rule you mentioned, such a man does not sin. For if he does nothing that he would not endure, you must find some other reason by which to prove that adultery is evil. I think it is evil because I've often seen men condemned for this crime. What? Haven't you seen many men condemned for just deeds? You need only to look back over history, that very history, to avoid sending you to other books, which excels because of its divine authority. You will soon find there what bad opinions we would have had of the apostles and all the martyrs if we decided that condemnation is a sure proof of evil doing. All of these were judged worthy of condemnation because of their confession of faith. Therefore, if evil is whatever is condemned, in those days it was evil to believe in Christ and to confess the faith. If, on the other hand, not everything that is condemned is evil, you must find another reason for asserting that adultery is evil. I have no answer to give you. <laughs> Perhaps then lust is the evil element in adultery. As long as you look for evil in the overt act itself, which can be seen, you are in difficulty. To help you to understand that the evil element in adultery is lust, consider the case of the man who does not have the opportunity to lie with another man's wife, but nevertheless, if it is somehow obvious that he would like to do so, and would do so had he the opportunity, he is no less guilty than the man taken in the very act. Nothing is more obvious, and I now see that there is no need for a long discussion to show me how homicide and sacrilege and all the other sins are evil. Now it is clear that lust is dominant in every kind of evil doing. You find that? Did you follow that? Did most people follow that? That's why Obama is evil. <laughs> <laughs> because he allowed those two reporters to be, be um, decapitated. He couldn't pay ransom. That's right. He also did not allow their families to raise money to um, pay their ransom. He said he would have them arrested and they, they raised money for, to save their, their, um, their sons. And now that they have been decapitated, he wants to make war on people who decapitate them. Exactly. So, so he, he is he pushed the decapitation. He is evil because he's using their decapitation. He facilitated to commit a biggest civil war. That's right. <clears throat> That's right. Well, could, could you say that lust is like addiction, addiction to evil things, just yes, like there, addiction there is. to drugs? You know? Yes, that, that's an addiction. Infomania is an addiction. Drugs are an addiction. Uh, but let me ask you a, a different question. Um, do people who do drugs, do they think that's good? Yes. Or no. 
Most of them. Are people are happy, happy who do drugs? No. <laughs> yes and no. Yes and no. No, no. I think practically all of them no, maybe you. start out desiring it. But once they are captured by it, they realize that they're a slave to, to the drug. That's right. <coughs> they, they become, become slaves. They, become, uh, they can't help themselves. Right. They have no choice anymore. That's right. No, you're you're not happy. You're never happy. But you can, uh, at at mo in moments, delude yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are mere flashes. There there are mere moments. And uh, no, you were miserable to begin with, and mm -hmm. that will only uh, worsen as you remain in that realm. Mm -hmm. Let's take another thing about. Uh, I'll take this question another step further. Um, what about the the question? Let's think of Nazi Germany for a second, okay? Now Hitler came to power in Nazi Germany, and Germany, you know, years before that was the center of very high culture, as Diane had mentioned before. You had Beethoven, Mozart, Haydn, Bach, you had Schiller, Goethe, Lessing, Mendelssohn, just an unbelievable, you know, great thinkers, writers. And yet, you know, after these men died a century later, you know, after World War I and the reparations hit Germany pretty hard, it made it possible for Hitler to come into power. Now, what do you think of the pe of people in Germany who allowed, I mean, I think I know what you think of people like Goering, that Goering was absolutely, you know, an evil being. Goebbels, um, Mendela, these, these people were absolutely evil. But what about, you know, Joe Schmidt and his wife, and their three children, and you know, uh, Clara Berg, or, or other people in Germany. Why? What? What about them? Why did Hitler come to power? Did what did they do to make Hitler come into power? Order for. Hmm? Order for. Um, actually, they did it. They. They. He actually. He actually lost the vote. I'm sorry. He actually lost the vote. He was declared. He was de he was declared chancellor by Hindenburg. His party was second in, in, in numbers. Was the party wasn't it? I mean, Reichstag. No. Monday number two, the second party had the second most amount of votes. Yeah, but he they he was given power by the prime minister. Dennis once said that um, that uh, he was blackmailed the um, chancellor to giving Hitler power because Hitler had some passenger on his son. Yeah, probably. It's, so, all right, but all right, let's go still, let's not avoid the fact. What, what is the difference between Nazi Germany and Hitler in America and Obama today? Is there any difference? No. Well, I think the problem is with, with both what you're looking at is that in the population, they have responsibility to take responsibility for the nation, and they refuse to do that. So that is a sin of omission. omission. So <coughs> good-hearted people can commit yes. some pretty heinous sins. Yes, uh, like today, yes. the problem here is uh, <coughs> com complacency and indifference, and uh, that's it, even true yeah. in religion. They talk the talk, but they don't walk the walk. They're looking for other things, mm -hmm. prosperity rather than... Uh, yeah, they lust for course. other things. Yeah. They lust for temporal things. I have to buy this, I have to have that, I've got... Go ahead, Brian. The, the thing was that nobody in Germany had the majority vote. In reality, Hitler had only like 43%. Yeah, but you're avoiding, uh, well, you're avoiding that, this. What, what you're avoiding, no, let no, me, no, let, let me finish, let me, let no, me finish. No, because Hitler had 43%, and 
but he had the major portion. That's why they declared him chancellor. But in our system, our electoral system, Obama had to have the majority vote or he could be elected president. Because they were, yeah, because but you're they, missing the whole but question. The 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 but then you're missing the whole question. You're, you're thinking the, about but the, the question is, that's are we can. like Nazi yeah. Germany? That's my question. Are we you're, you're here in the about, United States you're like talking Nazi about Germany? The middle class mentality. That's right. Which is which is what Hitler said when he said that he liked the middle class. When you're talking about the German middle class. There was no German middle class. You know that, right? Yeah. So you're talking. You're talking about the mindset of the people and what their reaction is to whatever the input is. Okay, okay. Let's not argue on that basis because we're not getting anywhere. No one has to told me what they think about the idea of the United States, you know, acting like good Germans and allowing Obama not one term, Two terms, two terms, and have allowed him to commit many, uh, not only sins, but also against natural law, which is the Constitution. He's committing sins against natural law. I never forget the intent. Okay, everybody wants to talk one at a time, one at a time. Ron. Yes, and that's why this setback, and you know, play along to get along. And just let it happen. So are we like? So are they like? Are they like the German? They're doing the same exact thing. They're doing the same thing as Nazi Germany. Right. And they're going you, with the flow. They're going with the flow. Okay. Well, I I wouldn't say that Obama is, is exactly like Hitler. Oh, I believe. No, no, wait a minute. He may have a Nero type personality. He tries to do things without congressional approval, but Obama is not saying kill the Jews or get rid of the whole... No, he's saying kill the kill Arabs, class. kill the whole Evil. Middle East, every no, person no, no, there. I, I, I he's out to murder them. Okay, okay. There is a difference. I I disagree, I disagree. Let me hear from Marcel in the back. Marcel, what would you say? No, I think I would say if we wake up and we are honest about things, unreservedly, we are basically, and I've, I've talked about, you know, I've talked about this to people in school before, we are basically in a very unfortunate way, and hopefully we can turn it into a fortunate way, in terms of learning how a renaissance works in the midst of a crisis, but we are understanding something we don't really understand, which is how Nazi Germany and the Nazi threat came to be. Because we think in our minds, a lot of us, well, you had stormtroopers marching through the streets from the very beginning, mm -hmm. and nobody put up any fight. That's or right. Hitler was talking about a global dictatorship, the thousand year right, mm -hmm. and nobody really did anything but that is extremely naive and extremely, I, I would just say just one other thing quickly. I think you've talked about a number of things today. You've talked about um, the idea of education. You've talked about uh, religion. We're talking about the idea of not realizing what's going on now. And I was thinking that the common denomination in all of this is the lack of, well, it is really education, understanding metaphor. Let's go a step further. Okay, let's take another step forward. Okay, what what is the real evil here that we're dealing with? What is what you? What did Franklin Roosevelt here say? He said, "You have nothing to fear but fear, but fear itself. itself." Would you agree that most Americans, who are good-natured, good-hearted people, are absolutely overcome with sheer terror, yes. Yes. fear. Would you agree with me? Total fear. Total fear. Total fear. From the standpoint, fear 
and that that if they do something, the government might find out You're something going back to the chasing the uh, that happened in Nazi through. Germany. Isn't it the same thing we're going through right now? Well, I'm thinking of the, uh, the communists in Hollywood that they chased. They're eavesdropping on, on the Saudi telephone calls. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. What did you say? They're eavesdropping on. on uh, well, yeah, but that's no that eavesdropping on yeah. everybody. Yeah. But, but, but is that an excuse? Yeah. Is fear an excuse not to do the good? I think it's no, even more it's not than just more than fear, not just external fear of the government, but if you're talking to someone or a person's talking to you and you say, if I acknowledge what they're saying and don't just brush it aside, then I have a responsibility to do something and I admit that. I think that's the most uh, debilitating type of fear. Right. Okay. I think the, fear, the fear in America is different. The fear is of the corporations. Most people will not correct the wrongs being permitted being, and being done by large corporations. Not just the government, not just what's happening. No, no, you're Obama missing the point. Taking, you're missing the point about fear. No, okay, one well, second. no, right. The average Wait, person, why don't they finish. speak out? Right. About some well, of these things. No, that's not because of corporations. Though. It's not. Be, it it's is. Not, not. It is not because of that. It's when you go, when, it's can I run the classroom? Thank you. Um, take the idea of real fear mm -hmm. for a moment. You go up to somebody, and let's say, you know, you have a copy of EIR with you and you're on the subway and you're reading a big article about Obama being bad and evil. And the person next to you says, what is that you're reading? Mm -hmm. how, how, what's going on there? What, what, do people, what do people do? What are things you could do? You could close the book, okay, mm -hmm. to avoid the discussion, okay. or what you could do is tell them educate them. Educate Explain them. How would you, how would we, with free will, you have to, all right, assume that the person you're talking to has free will and is fearful and is lustful, okay? Is what? Lustful. Fearful lustful, okay, they have all of these problems, but they're basically good-hearted people. How do you get through the good-heartedness to make them see really what they are, that they are committing this horrible sin of omission, and the United States is going to go the way of Hitler unless we stop Obama? How, how, how do we do that? Well, you edu as you said, you educate them. You tell them what you know. You have mm -hmm. to educate the congressman. Well, yeah. 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 No, you don't, can't forget about the congressman. The congressman, you know, people are terrified of calling their congressman. They are. People are terrified. From, oh, what do I say to him? He's so important. You know? No, it's not. I mean, these guys are, they're schmucks. <laughs> most of them, you know, they, most of them are, they, you know, they have, a lot of them are controlled by Wall Street, many of them are, are, are you know, not are egotistical. Nonetheless, there are some good people there, and even if you don't have a majority, if you have a good minority, you still could overturn it. You could do it. You could call your congressman today who's afraid of impeaching Obama, and you could make a very, very competent, good argument about why he's got to be overthrown, and why, if he isn't overthrown, why that congressman is guilty of the sin of omission. They're afraid of losing their pensions. Hmm? Afraid of losing their pensions. Afraid of losing their pensions. Pension. We're talking about Pension. fear again. Yeah. I know. Um, some months ago, I was with my cousin who has a relationship to HMOs, 
Mm -hmm. uh, we were there on the occasion of her, her father was uh, in hospice and we were waiting, it was a waiting game, a matter of hours. We were in a conversation and so I took the opportunity to go into something that she knows very well since she's familiar with HMOs uh -huh. uh, and the evil, their evil intent, their history. She was in agreement. She actually, as you would imagine, understood in greater detail what I was going through. And she agreed. Then I used the word, this is murder. And what she did was, uh, again, this was a conversation that was back and forth. I wasn't just preaching to her. But then you saw the fear kick in. You saw the I'm helpless and hopeless against this. And she began coming up, there was a pause, and she said, well, you know, the hospitals used to overspend, and the hospital, she began coming up with the same specious, weak arguments that she herself does not really believe. This was astounding, I was really struck by this, right, because we were having this conversation. So, I would like an answer to the question that you posed. I would repose it because, frankly, I was just, I couldn't get through at that point. The more I would try to solve, I, there was education wasn't what she needed. I could not help her overcome her fear, other than tell her that that's what exactly what she was doing. Right. Now she's also someone that will reject working with us because we fight. She just doesn't want it. People want to sit around it like the campfire girls, <laughs> and they're happy to do that with me. But then we say, "Well, this is where I've been, or this is what I'm doing, or this." Right? And they're like, "Oh, you guys are fucking serious about this shit." Mm -hmm. you see, so it's a big problem. It's a big battle, and she is the perfect example of what is an otherwise good person. Right? She's nice, a good heart, but person. she's gonna go. She's on her way to the gallows. Right. Right? She's in her mid-60s. Yeah. She doesn't have much time left. And I think she senses that when she reads Obamacare and her role in HMOs. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, other than uh, con confrontation, mm -hmm. at that point, you know, for a lot of people it's not education. You don't have to tell people that the building's on fire. But they don't want to run out. Mm -hmm. Self-preservation. They're afraid. They're afraid of self-preservation. I don't want to die. Well, I'll be yeah, part of you know, that that's, that's, that's fine. Still. Nobody wills to die. Sorry. Okay. Self-preservation. If I if I stand up, I'm gonna get lose my job. I'm gonna lose my job, or if I join Something a group, else. I might be told by my parents, "Get the hell out of here and don't come back." You've got to take a stand. And believe what you what you believe in. Right. And that takes courage. That's an interesting. Yes, it does take courage. It takes courage. What is the problem with the person that Alvin just described, who was a good-hearted person, but who got afraid of the idea of what Alvin said, which is this is whistle. murder. They don't want to be a whistleblower. They're afraid of being a whistleblower. Yeah, but what? It, let's get a little more down to it. What are we dealing with in the American population with this question of fear? What? What is it? Yeah. Well, we got uh, very used to our society. Got very used to uh, flattery. So you got to you got to admonish. When you admonish, you're doing a confrontation. Mm -hmm. And when you do a confrontation, uh, they don't have to necessarily agree, but you're expressing your feelings, and they have an innate ether, whatever, or what is good. Mm -hmm. And when you say that, uh, they go into denial. Uh, a lot of times they may agree with you, but they go into denial. For example, I was, when I was working, we had a, a fairly well-known pastor on our TV. And uh, he liked to what I was saying, and I used to give him literature, and he had some young <coughs> pastors with him. And one day they assigned me to Finley Plaza, and I sat at the desk, and uh, he saw me, he says, oh, what do you think about Obama now? And I says, well, uh, that's when Jerry Pines was repeating about, I see the handwriting on the wall. I told him right. I got the first hundred days. Yeah. And uh, then the other two preachers came, and they said, well, 
you got to give him a chance. Now, there was a guy who was a painter who worked in Finley House across the street. Right. And he agreed everything I said. Everything I everything. said. Okay. Except that that day when he heard the past, he was going to go in the elevator. And he heard this, I won't name him, but he knew uh, uh, this, this uh, uh, pastor. And when he heard uh, him saying, give him a chance, he said the same thing. It was just like a, uh, you know, like a parrot. He yeah, said, yeah, right, give, yeah, give, right, give, give him a right, chance, exactly, give him a chance. Exactly. And now he was surprised because he agreed with me, but because the pastor was famous in his own right. He had so what are, pe what are people who do that? What would these you are, call them? These are yes people. These Cowards. are people who. Thank you. They suffer from, like Obama, an overdose of vitamin I in their system. So they're like flattered. There, this is, yes, and I want to address that issue because I have a funny story about it. But absolutely, it's cowardice. Good-hearted people who are cowards. You know what they do in the army to cowards? Bill knows, right? They shoot cowards, don't they, Bill? So... What's, you know, what is, what do we have? We have fear, okay, and, and, and cowardice. Go ahead. I think this, this is really, this is really the ultimate question if we are going to um, save society. And I'm, I'm probably as bad at it or worse at it than anyone I know when what Alvin described, you do exactly that. You know, you talk to them, you have a really great briefing, you can back it up with provable statistics and everything, and that even goes beyond that, because from what Alvin mentioned, the person he was talking to herself knew that he was right, but it's the person that has to move. So I think somehow, I have to do it, we have to focus ourselves on elevating that person we're talking to, to see themselves and to see their identity in terms of a human being, because all the things that we th that they talk about, or all the things that they are really saying when they talk to us, my job, the way I'll be looked at by those around me, my pension, my security, my life, well, we have to, I guess, get ourselves to see and then get others to see, we're all going to die sometime, but what does it mean that we are a human being in a crisis in the moment. In other words, what was FDR thinking? What was Kennedy thinking? What was Moses Mendelssohn thinking? What was Yitzhak Rabin thinking? Because we need to realize that we, and we need to communicate to others, that we can be those people right. on the basis of finding our humanity. That's right, that's right. So we're, deal we're dealing with people who are good-hearted cowards, <laughs> fearful, Cowards. And we have to bust through that. I mean, can can you, now on the idea of flattery, I didn't want to let that go. Um, Dante, the great Italian poet, uh, who wrote the Divine Comedy, one of the big sinners that ends up in hell is the flatterers. And if I'm not mistaken, I think he has them upside down in excrement <laughs> as their punishment for for pandering, flattering, you know. So I just wanted to throw that you. I thought you could have said Dante, please, would you? Um, yeah, in fear. You know, what happens is, is that your feelings take over, okay? And that's all the thing about, that's why feeling states, sense certainty, is so evil. Because it can prevent you from doing the good. This fear, this cowardness, it all comes from the sense certainty. And you have to think, for example, about the think about courage for a moment, okay? Instead of cowardice, let's look at courage. Um, How about those two uh, journalists who had their heads chopped off? They, they, they were doing their job, they did what was opposed to do, and they took the consequences of their beliefs 
chop their heads off. That's the, that's the, the, the fear. It's the fear of Let, Let's take another example. Yeah, that's right. Let's take another example. What about the invasion of Normandy back in 44? Oh what did it take for men to go on a beach, yeah, okay, get out of that boat and get out of the boat, of them to and them. basically they were like big sitting bullseyes, ducks. sitting ducks, okay, but they ran on that beach and they watched their fellow human beings get slaughtered, yeah. and, but they kept going and going and going and going, and what was the result, what was the result of that kind yeah. of courage? We won. Yeah. We won. We won. Yeah. It's literally Christian. I may die so that others can live. Yes. That's Christian? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, was that with a German Jew or just a Jew? Oh. Who? Oh, God. Oh, he was just, he was Austrian. He was Austrian. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't even German. <laughs> He wasn't, he wasn't. Uh, uh, I often think about that, how I was spared. Yes, oh, really? You let, me, let me hear it, Bill. Yeah. Yeah, I often think about that, how if I'd have been in the very initial wave, I wouldn't be here to talk to you today. Uh -huh. Fortunately, I came a little bit after the first, immediate uh, in, invasion. Yes. Okay, I was in the third wave. Uh -huh. But even still, at that particular time, there was complete devastation everywhere you were. 6,000 men died that day yes. on the beach. Almost nothing was standing. Almost nothing was standing. Yeah. What kind of courage does it? You, you remember this, you'll never forget it, will you? That's this sort of courage. That's indelibly written up here, never to be forgotten. Never to be forgotten. During World War II, uh, the military, <coughs> they, uh, they had a thing for, uh, against courage. They gave you, uh, they advised you to take a poison pill. You would have been captured rather than the world's care. information. Oh, but that's yeah. for a different reason. That's for a that's different reason. That takes yeah. Yeah, that's for a different yeah. reason. They did that because if, I, I know this, the French resistance movement, okay, was often, they were, they captured were captured by the Gestapo, yeah. and they would torture, right. literally torture to get names out of people. Mm -hmm. So the reason they would give them these capsules is that if they couldn't sustain, you know, the torture and would therefore give up names and get a lot of other people to kill, right. that they had to take the poison. That takes a lot of courage. That took courage too, you know. So that's a uh, I wouldn't. There, there was a reason for that. There was, there was. Yeah, they didn't do that in Nor at Normandy. They just gave you extra bullets. That's right. <laughs> no, you didn't have, you didn't have cyanide in, uh, at uh, Normandy. But well, these other things, they were supposed to send tanks in front of them, which the British Army did, mm -hmm. uh, to, um, you know, protect the men rushing on after them. The tanks did not do a good job figuring out. The tanks just sunk. Mm -hmm. So when the landing craft came with the soldiers, there was nothing in front of them. <coughs> mm -hmm. So the army, the you know, powers that be, failed them. Well, actually, uh, that's true. Um, in fact, I don't, I, I don't want to get sidetracked. <coughs> Uh, let me just say that um, Normandy should have happened probably about two years before it actually happened. And what held Nor the invasion of Normandy back were the British. Yes. Yeah. Well, it was Churchill specifically. So okay. They had their empire. It was they did the not empire. want the invasion of no, Normandy. No, he was he wanted to go through. They uh, wanted Serbia to, to, to destroy Russia. Russia. So they wanted to go through you just, to the Slavic countries. Exactly. So right next to Exactly. Russia. So, you know, that's, um, uh, that's why 6,000 men had to die on June 6, 1944. But that's 1944. why Hitler was there to begin with. 
was the British. That, yes, that, exactly. That and what about Obama? What do we? I mean, so we have the same thing here. This is this feels is like deja vu again. Yeah. <laughs> We've been through this before. I thought that uh, Adolf Hitler knew in advance about Normandy. He was said. Yeah. I don't think so. <laughs> I think they, I think that's probably true. I, 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 I wouldn't, I wouldn't doubt it. They maybe they didn't know the day, but they certainly knew at some point something it was, was coming. coming. Something was coming at some point, but they didn't know when. And they had, they were lucky because. They had a, a, some sort of a holiday or retreat, and a lot of German soldiers were back, had gone for yes. a holiday. So they didn't have a full battalion up there. They didn't have well, the tanks, because the tanks were in Africa. I want to ask a question. So, didn't the British suggest that he leave the North Africa first? Yeah, the Germans. That's were right, not right, right. Gordon, but but they should because they were British. afraid if we landed in Normandy, that the invasion would fail. Yeah, we you know, yeah. 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 let's hear Denise's question. I'll go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, Denise, you want to go first? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm going to answer this question. Yeah. 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 I just have a quick question. Sure. Okay. How do you folks feel? The Spanish Civil War figures into this. Which oh, some yeah. historians say was the dress rehearsal for World War II, and Hitler couldn't have stopped then. Why didn't the United States do something then? The Spanish Civil War, I'm talking about. Oh, oh Franco. Franco. Frank, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And then who remained in power until the 70s with our support. Right. That's very significant to me. Mm -hmm. uh, I read a lot of history on that. But I was wondering uh -huh. what the consensus is of the good folks here who seem to be very informed and very impressed. Well, I remember we had um, a supporter going back when I joined uh, LaRouche in 1974, 40 years ago. Okay. And we had an old uh, stalwart, uh, wonderful man. His name was Archie Marsh. And uh, he was about 70 or 80 years old back then. And uh, he was in the Lincoln Brigade right. yeah. that went to Spain to fight against Franco. Yes. Right. Yeah. And, you know, he, he always would crack us up. He would always say, well, we'll, we'll get the revolution as soon as the belly button hits the backbone. <laughs> he would say something like that. But he was, he was absolutely wonderful, marvelous human being, as old as he would, he would take uh, stacks of the New Solidarity newspapers, put a couple around his shoulders, and every week he would get out hundreds of newspapers. So he was a man with tremendous courage. But um, I wanted to actually get back to this thing about um, God. This gentleman has something to say. Uh, can we yeah, not do that right now? But after, uh, after the class, we'll do it. Let, let me let me go on because this is stuff is important. What we're all bringing up. What? What? Um, if we see a good man burned by fire in the performance of a duty, okay, we call this not the punishment of sin but a proof of courage and endurance. Do you agree with me? I'm sorry, could you read that again? Okay. If you see a good man, what if he's a fireman? He runs into the house, he saves somebody, but he gets horribly burned in the process. Is that a punishment from God? No. 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 What do we say about that man? He's correct. He's courageous. Yes, of course he's courageous. Okay. So punish. So the idea of physical punishment is not necessarily um, evil. No, it happens. In getting burned described as evil. I also want to ask you um, about evil. Let's go back to evil for a second. Let's go back to that. I go back to the beginning. 
are the white phrases. Um, does evil have power? Does evil have power? Yes. yes. I would say yes. yes. You would say yes. It has the illusion of power, as Alvin mentioned earlier. What it, do you know what evil is? We discussed it a little bit, but we didn't. We didn't really go through the whole book. Saint Augustine actually, you know, his whole book goes through this whole question. It's like the consciousness. Well, conscience, your conscience gives you. Um... Don't you? Let me ask you this: Do people choose to be evil? No. Unless they're born that way, the psychopaths are. <laughs> I, I don't particularly buy into that because it's, um, you know, you, it, it excuses too much. I can see a case where a child is brought up in a rotten household and turns out to be a rotten person. But I don't believe that, you know, that nature creates evil. In fact, if what Augustine s says is, is that evil as a force doesn't even exist. Do you follow me? He's saying evil does not exist. Because you have a person has to commit evil. It can't, it doesn't, it's not out there by itself, like, right. like, like a building or something, like a car. It has to be, it's an act, has to, has to be performed. So what has to be done, so, so, so in other words, we have, let's say we have God, okay? St. Augustine, as I told you before, the first cult that he joined, this Manichaean cult, believed in the Prince of Darkness and the Prince of Light. And he came out of there saying, that's crazy, I don't believe this anymore. You know, he just, through a lot of discussions and organizing and throughout his life, he just decided that this was not the truth. And truth is higher than reason. Truth is, is God. And that's what, he, that's what he was searching for his whole life. So what Augustine said is, is that evil as a force, of, you know, uh, something to reckon with, doesn't exist. That God, created the good. God didn't create evil. And he made man perfect in the image of himself and he made him perfect. Well, you see, there's a thing about man. Man is 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 and is not like God. He's made in the image of God, but he's not he's he's not God. No. Okay. Would a good God create evil? God didn't no. create evil. He no. Never, because he would go against everything that he that he stands for. That's that. right. But in your question, do men choose to do evil? Some men do. Like like Hitler chose to do evil. Right. He so believed in a superior race. Right. He wouldn't listen to reason. He wouldn't. He, he even didn't trust his own. Yeah, but what, what about what about the your neighbor? Okay, what about your neighbor who will do nothing to stop Obama? Is that evil or no? No, I wouldn't call it evil. I would call it evil. I would call it. Yeah. 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 Well, but he's not specifically doing evil mm -hmm. to someone, like to hurt someone or to murder someone. Yeah. Well, that, that, that is that, evil. That's his yeah. 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 thing. Okay. okay. Yeah. So, so, let's go back. Yeah. So, let's go back again. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't say Cur that's Courage that's comes in there somewhere. Right. Where it doesn't come. God <laughs> does not create evil. God created only the good. What did Let's go back again to the beginning. What did God do that he loved man so much? What did he give him? That he gave his, un, his son. A son, but also what did he give, give us? Free will. Free will. Free will. Yeah. To accept 
or to reject. Or to reject. Okay. You were going to say something? As I was going yes. to refer back to the first murder where Cain killed Abel. Why did he kill him? He killed him out of jealousy. jealousy. Right. And that's one of the things of evil. Right. So God does not create evil. No. Men choose evil. So what about the guy on your block, okay, who is not doing anything to stop Obama? Yeah. This, this is a fabrication of man. Evil is a fabrication of man. He means that, that evil is created by men, that men choose to do evil. Okay, and what I'm trying to get at is the idea that there are some people who don't exactly choose to do evil, but they don't choose to do anything. There you go. Okay? So yes. evil is the absence of the good. Absolutely. Go. Evil is the absence of the good. good. We've got to be, learn to be... Uh, so I mean, if you don't do good, then you do evil. If you're not doing good. If you're not doing good, what are you doing? You're doing no good. <laughs> yeah, what is the result if you're not acting? Whatever you say your intent is, what is the result? Not evil. The is good yeah. and evil is terrible result. things. That's what I admire about Indy LaRouche. <laughs> He's a great intercessor. I mean, uh, you know, in, in, like in, in Noah's day, he needed somebody to speak up against the nation, the government. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, people don't want, he couldn't find anybody, he put uh, Jonah, he picked other people in the Bible. And, and we have to be intercessors, we have to be able to confront people mm -hmm. and, and not hide. Yes. But let me also tell you something about the goodness of God, okay? And I think this is important to you know, what you're saying too, and to us who have to go out and organize people. Augustine says in the latter part of his book, he says, uh, the created order would be preserved even if every angelic creature revolted against God. That God is still the God of love and perfect. No matter, I mean, you cannot, whatever happens, you cannot blame God for anything. Right. You cannot blame God. You are not forced to sin. You are not forced to sin. You abstain by your own free will. If you did will to sin, the unutterable force of God's power would suffice to rule the universe. In other words, no matter no matter what would happen, you know, it would God would still be God. God is a beautiful goodness. And that's why I think that the idea that Lynn has talked about and everybody's talked about the idea of being in the image of God is so important. You can't follow what your neighbor's going to do. You have to take your neighbor by, you know, his little horns. <laughs> Shake them up. You gotta educate them. But you also have to you also have to tell him the truth. Right. You have to tell him the truth about what he is doing if he does not do the good. You have to be able to say to somebody that your inaction by not taking on Barack Obama will get us all killed. What you're doing is evil. What you're doing is you're supporting, okay, uh, thousands of, of terrorists raping, killing, and destroying, you know, children, women, and men, and men in the Middle East. Why can't our congressmen come to that conclusion? Because we are the congressmen. We are the leaders. The congressmen right now, for the most part, Diane went through this earlier, there are some good ones out there that are really trying to make a fight. Mm -hmm. 
and we've got to back them up. And we have to, we have to fight for that. That's going to have to be a, a very big fight. And it's going to have to require a great deal of courage on the part of everyone here. And that's where our neighbor comes in, because we are maybe 20, 30 people going to Congress two or three times a week, maybe another 100 or so nationwide, maybe 200 call. But if we had, again, even 5,000, 10,000 people going to Congress calling, this would be done tomorrow. And so our neighbors are ultimately important. Okay. So we all right. Um, I just want to take, um, let me just. I think what I'll do right now, um, all right, I think what I'm going to do is take some questions. And I'll, I'll just open the floor at this point on the idea of evil, free will, lust, okay, fear, cowardice, you know, jealousy, education. Uh, do you have more from St. Augustine? I think it would be really good. Would yeah, I do. You, yeah. You, do you want to read? I think it would be good for people to hear more, yeah. Yeah, okay. Because they've done a lot of talking, but Augustine hasn't said that much. That's <laughs> good. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a good idea. I think what we should do. Um, Could I read something briefly from Martin Luther King? All right, yeah, as long as it's long. brief. <laughs> I say to you this morning that if you have never found something so dear and precious to you <clears throat> that you will die for it, then you aren't fit to live. You may be 38 years old, as I happen to be, and one day, some great opportunity stands before you and calls upon you to stand for some great principle, some great issue, some great cause. And you refuse to do it because you are afraid. You refuse to do it because you want to live longer. You're afraid that you will lose your job. You're afraid that you will be criticized or that you will lose your popularity or you're afraid that somebody will stab or shoot or bomb your house. You refuse to take a stand. Well, you may go on and live until you are 90, but you are just as dead at 38 as you would be at 90. <laughs> and the cessation of breathing in your life is but the belated announcement of an earlier death of the spirit. You died when you refused to stand up for right. You died when you refused to stand up for truth. You died when you refused to stand up for justice. Hmm. Yeah, King well, understood this right very well. He gave, he gave his, his let, let me, let's, let's hear from Augustine again. Diane and I are gonna talk about eternal law and human law, okay? And were they the same and were they not? So, um, this is Augustine, he's developing this idea of absolute truth and the idea of universals and the idea of natural law. Not man-made law, but natural law, like the Declaration of Independence or the beginning of the uh, Constitution. <coughs> so um, I'm, I'm gonna play Augustine again and I'll start out. <clears throat> but let us examine carefully, if you will, how far evil deeds are to be punished by law that governs people in this life. Then let us see what remains to be punished by divine providence, inevitably and in secret. I should like to, if only it might be possible to reach a conclusion of such a great question, for I think the problem limitless. Yes, but have great courage. 
Lean upon piety and follow the paths of reason. There is nothing so hard and difficult that it cannot be made clear and obvious by God's help. Let us take up our investigation then, depending on him, and praying for his help. First tell me whether the law that is published in writing is helpful to men living in this life. Of course it is, for nations and states are composed of these men. Are these men and nations of such a nature that they are completely eternal, neither passing away nor changing? Or are they mutable and subject to time? This race is mutable, surely, and a prey to time. Who would doubt it? Therefore, if a nation is well ordered and serious, and a most watchful guardian of the common interest, whose every citizen places the public good above his private interest, is not the law rightly made under which the people are allowed to elect magistrates of their own choice, through whom their own welfare, that is the public welfare, is administered? Yes, it is. Furthermore, if this same nation gradually becomes depraved, preferring private welfare to public welfare, buying and selling votes, being corrupted by men who love power, and finally turning its government over to evil men and criminals, isn't it right that at such a time a good man who is outstanding and has the greatest ability should take the power of conferring offices from this people and reduce the government to a few noblemen or even to one? It is right. Therefore, although these two laws seem to be opposed to each other and that one gives to the people the power of conferring offices and the other takes it away, and although the second law is made so that both laws cannot exist at the same time in the same state, still we would not say, would we, that either law is unjust and ought not to be enforced? By no means. Therefore, if you agree, let us call a law temporal, when although it is just, it can justly be changed in the course of time. Let us agree to this term. Okay. What is the law called the highest reason, summa ratio? which ought always to be obeyed, the law through which evil men deserve a wretched life and good men a happy one, and through which finally the law that we have just called temporal is rightly passed and rightly changed. Can anyone who understands it think it is not immutable and eternal? Can it ever be unjust that the evil are wretched and the good happy? or that the well-ordered and serious nation should elect its own officials, while the wicked nation should be deprived of this power? I see that this law is eternal and immutable. I think that, too, you understand that in temporal law, there is nothing just and lawful which men have not derived from eternal law. If a nation at one time confers offices justly, and at another time, still quite justly, does not confer offices, this change, although it is temporal, is just. For it has been derived from eternal law, under which it is always just for serious people to confer offices, and for fickle people to be unable to do so, or do you hold another point of view? I agree. To put it in a few words as best I can, the notion of eternal law that must be impressed upon our minds, it is that law which it is just that everything be ordered in the highest degree. If you have an objection, state it now. I have no objection, for you speak the truth. Therefore, Although there is one law, according to which all temporal laws are governing, are for governing men are changed, the eternal law itself cannot be changed, can it? 
I understand that it cannot be changed. No force, no chance, no misfortune can ever bring it about that it is not just for everything to be ordered in the highest degree. Yeah. Mm. So that's what Augustine has to say. That's interesting. What page is that? Uh, 14, 13, 14, 15. It brings to light, you know, the God of Abraham, you know. When, when you, he did the way, do away with the law, but the law expanded and it gave more freedom because this way man was not under all ceremonies and everything like that. But it was very good, very interesting. P, I would recommend people read this. I would recommend yeah, that you go out and you buy this book yeah, and you take book. it home and read it. What? I've only presented a very little of St. Augustine. He writes in this book, he has three books, book one, book two, book three. I've only read, Diane and I have only taken on three chapters of book one. We haven't touched book two or book three. I mean, we have, in essence. But I, I highly recommend that people read this on the free choice of the way. Sure. Yeah, I don't know about the publisher. You can find it online, probably. On free choice of the well by St. Augustine. Um, so, is that clear, what we just went through? Yeah. Temporal law, eternal law? What's temporal law? Yeah. Temporal yeah. law is like, you know, you, you, you shouldn't shoot your neighbor. It's also eternal. Uh, temporal law is more like... If your neighbor is going to kill 75 people, then you can shoot your neighbor. Right. So the eternal law is different. Right. Or a temporal law is like, um, let's see, uh, you can't park in the street when the snow falls. All right. Or, let's see, you know, any, any law that can be changed, right. that in time would be different, okay? Yeah. That is temporal law. E natural law or eternal law comes from God. It's like the idea of um, somebody give me the beginning of the Declaration of Independence. When in the course of human events? When, uh, oh, how about the Constitution? Um, what's the beginning? We hold these truths to be self-evident. And the pursuit of happiness. That is to be good. That's the pursuit of happiness. Well, can, can you say that sometimes it's necessary to do evil in order to the people? Like to do evil against people that are doing evil? To find well, fire with fire in a sense, or, or am I wrong? Or well, no, that's what a soldier does, right? A soldier, all yeah, right, what he does is he goes into war and he kills somebody. It's a okay? against But the thing it's is, it's a higher good. So one. even though murder and killing are wrong, in this case, in a just war, it's perfectly legitimate. Okay, Diane, I'm going to have Diane take over.